Hey, everybody. It's episode 59. We're back with Jody for part two. So if you are just starting with the Birth Story podcast, rewind to episode 58 and catch Jody's home birth in Colombia, South America. Then come back to this episode, episode 59, part two, and we're going to hear all about Jody's home birth here in America. Let's get to it. What does a contraction feel like? How do I know if I'm in labor? And what does the day of labor look like? Wait, is this normal? Hey, I'm Heidi. My best friends call me Hydes. I'm a certified birth doula, host of this podcast, and author of Birth Story, an interactive pregnancy guidebook. I have supported hundreds of women through their labor and deliveries, and I believe every one of them and you deserves a microphone and a stage. So here we are. Listen each week to get answers to these tough questions. Birth Story, where we talk about pregnancy, labor, deliveries, where we tell our stories and share our feelings. And of course, chat about our favorite baby products and motherhood. And because I'm passionate about birth outcomes, you will hear from some of the top experts in labor and delivery. Whether you are pregnant, trying desperately to get pregnant, or you just love a good birth story, I hope you will stick around and be part of this birth story family. You guys, my book is out. I mean, it is out in the world. I cannot believe it. I have been writing it for several years and it's just mind blowing. Birth Story Pregnancy Guidebook and Journal is a one of a kind discovery into your pregnancy that provides you education through storytelling. So what's it really about? In the 16 years that I have served women with every personality type, I noticed there was a huge disconnect between what my clients were craving for childbirth education in a book and the books that were actually available on the market. There seemed to be unlimited resources if you are looking for an unmedicated birth or a natural birth or a home birth. But there just weren't a lot of resources for my clients who were part of the 92% of women birthing in a hospital and very much open to medical interventions like an epidural, nitrous oxide, and opioid medications. So I wrote that book to fill the gap for you. Week by week throughout your pregnancy, you will engage with material meant to educate and empower you as you plan for your own birth story hospital, medicated, unmedicated, or something in between. You are welcomed each week with a postcard from the womb, which is an adorable note from your baby about their miraculous development, as well as the amazing changes occurring within you. Then you are invited to use an uplifting birth affirmation and to respond to an introspective journaling prompt to document your feelings, curiosities, and wonders every single week. With room to memorialize your own birth story, this book will become a memory keeper and a legacy gift for your baby. You are encouraged to read one of my favorite birth stories each week filled with childbirth education, tidbits, and explanations of important medical terms and procedures. These are real-life accounts shared with permission from the births that I've attended during my career as a doula. And I gave you a great mix. In the 42-week guide to your pregnancy and 42 birth stories, seven of them end in cesarean section. About half are unmedicated and the other half are medicated deliveries. This is a judgment-free book. So take what you need from each element and leave the rest. Okay, are you ready to buy? I would love for you to go to birthstory.com and buy it directly from me. But I totally get it if you're an Amazon girl. You can head to Amazon.com and just type in birth story pregnancy and the book should pop up. I'll deliver it straight to your doorstep. And I would venture to say that you might be an audiobook kind of woman because you're listening to a podcast. So if you would prefer to listen to this book, then I have recorded it and it is available for download at audible.com or on your Audible app. Thank you for being part of the birth story community. I am so excited for you to have this book in your hand. 
once you've purchased it and it has arrived. I hope that you will give me your thoughts and feedback and don't forget to take a selfie with your book and post it on Instagram and tag at birth story podcast. Jody, I am so glad that we are continuing this conversation about your home birth here in the United States. And so mm-hmm. I'm so curious, like all the ways in which it would be different <laughs> from the previous episode that we recorded that hopefully everyone's listened to <laughs> on your home birth in Colombia, South America. And so first I need to just kind of understand, I feel like we were, we left off was like, you had this beautiful home birth in Colombia and like you had done this amazing ritual with your placenta. And now we're like jumping ahead and all of a sudden you live in the United States and you have another baby girl, Joy, who's six months old. And so why don't you just catch all of us up? Like, how did you get from Colombia back to the United States where it's your home country? Sure. So uh, my husband and I lived in Colombia for four years. After Quincy was born, we stayed in Colombia for two more years. And right before her second birthday, we, we moved back to the United States. And that was mostly, we were very happy there. We loved our city. We loved our school. We loved our friends. We were mostly ready just to be closer to family and give Quincy the opportunity to build relationships with our family. And so we moved home in the summer of 2018. So that was two years ago. And then April of our first year, full year back, uh, we found out we were expecting joy. So that's sort of the short version of how we, how we made our way back. Perfect. Now, were you trying to get pregnant? We were not. And uh, we, we, were, we found out on April 1st. And so it was kind of a, a funny joke for us. So with Quincy, we found out on my husband's birthday. So that was like the birthday gift. And then um, with Joy, um, we were surprised and I found out on April 1st. So that was kind of on April Fool's Day. So that was kind of a joke for us. But so did your husband like believe you or like, did you pull yeah, one? I am not the kind of person to really be able to pull off a joke like that. But he did believe me. I was like, this is not a joke. This is real. It is completely real. And I mean, when I took the pregnancy test, I remember with my first pregnancy, I took the test before it was, you know, recommended. And I was just like waiting, waiting, waiting to see. But when I took this pregnancy test, I mean, it was immediately positive. There was no mistaking it that it was definitely positive. Awesome. (laughs) Um, I went to dinner with a friend and kept the pregnancy test in my pocket the whole time I had dinner and then told my husband when when I got home from dinner. (laughs) That's crazy. I don't even know how you keep that a secret for even like one second. I mean, Uh, I'm just like, I'm not a secret keeper. It's very difficult for me. It would be a full-blown anxiety attack (laughs) if I had to make it through. If I had to make it through dinner, especially without any alcohol, which I'm assuming you probably know. Exactly. Yes. You know? Yeah. Okay. Well, you had this home birth and we, you know, we listened in your last story about how you ended up having a home birth in Colombia. Uh-huh. So now you're living in the United States. Did you know right away you wanted to have a home birth again? No, we didn't know right away that we were going to have a home birth. Um, we were looking at a, a birthing center that was very close by to where um, I was living that it ended up closing. I had scheduled an appointment and the birthing center closed just a few weeks or maybe a few days before my first appointment. I am going to jump in right there. I actually had just conducted a several other interviews where the moms were in the exact same situation. One was even 24 weeks pregnant when her birth center closed. And it's really important. I just want to put a disclosure out there that like Birth centers are closing around the country for different reasons. The one that I just interviewed in El Paso, Texas, they closed just because it was a tenant dispute and it was like they just had to move. A lot of the birth centers, and I know the chain that you're talking about, is it's a very hard to be profitable. So as everyone listening can imagine, a hospital stay overnight with an epidural and your IV and your IV port and all of your medicines and your blood pressure cuff every 15 minutes and your monitoring and your internal exams. I mean, every single time someone looks at you, that's like a billing code for Mm -hmm. the hospital. 
And it's very profitable. I mean, I think most of my clients that share their bills with me, if they have a medical intervention or an epidural, we're like 25 to 60 plus thousand dollars. But if you're at a birth center and you have no interventions, I mean, there's just not a lot to bill for. And so it's not profitable. So I just want to make sure that people listening aren't like, oh, birth center and come up in your head that it closed for any other reason. Like birth centers tend to close because it's hard for them to remain profitable. That's it. Mm -hmm. They're so Mm -hmm. safe to birth that. Mm -hmm. And we were, and we were very interested in that option as it was very close to our apartment. And it was also very close to a hospital and it was a, a good middle ground for everyone, for me and my husband and our family. But after that close, we went ahead and started our prenatal care with an OB and we kind of had home birth on the table, but we didn't really talk about it very much for the first part of the pregnancy. I went to, I had like regular typical prenatal appointments. I saw the midwives at the OB practice and it was great. I got great care. And then after the anatomy scan around 20 weeks, I was starting to think more about actually giving birth. And we, we knew um, from the anatomy scan that there were no concerns or anything. Um, and so I started to explore more and think about having another home birth. And um, just thinking about my experience with my first birth and just how wonderful it was, I just, I just couldn't stop thinking about it. I just couldn't let it go. And I'm really fortunate that my husband is really supportive. And, you know, at the end of the day, he was like, this is your body, your experience. He also had a great experience with our first child. And um, he was supportive of whatever I decided to do. I think I, I switched to home birth, midwife care. I think I was like 24 weeks, around 24, 26 weeks. Okay. You have to like dig in a little bit more. So someone's listening and they're like, they just went to their ultrasound and had their anatomy scan and they're mm. in that same headspace. What was the first thing you did? Like, how did you connect with a home birth midwife? So um, I was interested in, in finding a midwife, but because my first home birth was in a different country, it was kind of like a whole new landscape for me here. And the first, and I, I did know one other friend who had had two previous home births here. And so I, I talked to her and then I also asked in some of the mom groups, the local mom groups that I'm in. And I found quickly, I found a home birth community within the local mom groups. That was the the most um, helpful place that I got information. And um, pretty quickly, I was in touch with the home birth midwives in our in our um, community, and I was able to get information and talk with them and interview them. And um, it was once I got my foot in the door, it was pretty easy. Were the midwives in a group practice or were they independent? Did you have an opportunity to like interview and choose the mm-hmm. one particular person that you wanted to support you or how did that, mm-hmm. what did that look like? So there were two, there are two midwives, main home birth midwives in the general area where I live. And I was in touch with both of them. And one of them actually studied an apprentice under the other one. And so they were very well connected with each other. And they were both lovely, wonderful women with a lot of experience. And I ended up choosing the one that was closest to me, um, that lived within 10 minutes of my house. And so that was convenient, more convenient for us in terms of prenatals. And also um, when it came time for birthing, I knew that she would be uh, nearby. Okay. So I have like a couple of home birth questions that I want to mm-hmm. ask you before you get into your birth story. Mm-hmm. If anyone listening is considering a home birth, or maybe they had a hospital birth and now they are interested in having a home birth for a subsequent baby, I would really love, Jody, if you would walk me through the midwifery model of care for your prenatal visit. Mm. So what that felt like Yes. what that experience was like. Sure. So the prenatal, it was just wonderful and lovely and connecting. And 
personal. I, when I had switched to the midwife prenatals, all of my appointments were, I mean, usually at least an hour. They were in her home and I had plenty of time to talk about anything that I was feeling, any concerns that I had. She checked in on me physically, but also emotionally. When she listened to the baby's heartbeat, I was able to lay down on the bed. My three-year-old daughter was able to come with me. Before, when I had the prenatal appointments with the OB, I had already always scheduled for my mom or someone to come be with my daughter. But because I wasn't sure if we wanted Quincy to be there for the birth, I wanted her to get to know the midwives with what was happening. And so she came to those appointments with me and it was really great. She was available all the time. If I had, you know, questions for her or any concerns in between appointments, she was always available. And one thing that I really, really helped me trust her was that if there were things that I had questions about, and this happened one or maybe two times that Um, I had a concern and she gave me some of her own suggestions, but then always followed it up with, if you still feel concerned, see an OB. And so all along my, the prenatal experience with her, I knew and trusted her experience, her expertise, her training, and knew that if something was out of her expertise and training, that she would direct me to to a medical doctor. It was just a really lovely experience. It's so different, Jody, to hear you say words like personal, connection, lovely, trusted, together, hour-long appointments. <laughs> Your child was with you. I mean, for anyone listening, like this is the midwifery model of care. It's continuity of care. It's very personalized loving and attentive care. And it's very different and special. And you'll get this midwifery model of care in some senses when you choose a midwife in a, in a hospital environment. Also, it's a different experience, but it's very, very different for home birthing. And I, I just wanted you to share what that looked like because if anyone's like on baby two or three and they birthed at a hospital, like you know what I'm talking about, right? Like, <laughs> like we remember what it was like to have a four and a half minute long appointment and then <laughs> the doctor has gone and you're like, wait, wait, uh, okay, I guess I'll just ask it next week. So, yeah. so I mean, this sounds lovely having mm, your three-year-old with you and just feeling loved on. You had mentioned in Colombia that your midwife basically had all the tools for you. Here in the United States, How did that go as far as like preparing your home Mm -hmm. for a home birth? Right. So that was, that was different here. um, She put me in contact and gave me the resources to purchase a birth kit. And um, she actually, through the website, she had created her own kit, a personalized kit that had all of the things that she personally um, preferred. And obviously the things that were needed, but then also within the things that were needed, the ones that she, the type or brand or whatever that she had preference for. And so as a part of her practice, she also required you to attend like a four hour class that she hosted in her home with other mothers and their partners who were preparing for their birth as well. And so at that class, she went through all the materials that we would need gave us time to ask questions and then directed us to where we need to go to access to to purchase the things. And so it came with like the umbilical cord clamp and all of the sterile gloves. And I mean, it was just like a whole bunch of stuff that um, you need during that time. And then you could purchase your own tub, but she actually had several that she would lend out. So we we borrowed her tub and then purchased our own liner. I'm just assuming every midwife has their different preferred and trusted brands. Mm -hmm. But what a cool resource too. Like when you were just sharing about being in her home with these other couples that had made this autonomous decision 
you know, Mm -hmm. and having that connection. So along with this wonderful class, like in her home with these other couples, did that like count as like childbirth education also? Like if, if some of those couples were first time Mm -hmm. parents? So most, I think in my memory, there were maybe six or seven couples there. And I think that all of them were second time moms. And I was the only one who had had a previous home birth. Almost all of them, I mean, there may have been one other one, but I remember that overwhelmingly they were moms who were choosing home birth for their second birth because of um, a challenge that they had experienced in their first birthing time and were exploring other options for this experience. You said that so delicately, Jody, <laughs> and I appreciate it, but everyone knows. I mean, the reason my podcast exists is because I'm helping first-time moms or Mm -hmm. Mm 17-year-olds prepare for the births so that we have positive birth outcomes. But I mean, I wish I didn't even have to have a podcast like this because I just wish everyone had a great first experience. Mm -hmm. But hear us loud and clear. We think that home birth and birth center birth are just as wonderful options for birthing as hospital birthing. Let's just celebrate that there is a, a, a third way, you know? Yeah. And I say third way because I'm I, there's really like four, in my mind, four ways, right? Like <laughs> go to the hospital, you can go to the birth center, you can go to home birth, or you can free birth, you know? Mm-hmm. And there's probably, people will probably correct me and say there's seven <laughs> ways, you know? But how wonderful. Okay, so... Now I'm going to get into like, you've borrowed this tub, which is kind of, I don't even know how you time that with six or seven other couples, but you borrowed it. You bought the liner, you've got your birth kit, you're like ready. And tell me about what it was like kind of at the end of your pregnancy, Mm. how you were feeling. And the number one question everyone wants to know, how the heck did you know you were in labor? Okay. This is great because it was very different than my first one. So towards the end, so my first daughter was born at 39 weeks and four days. And I know that you can never, you know, babies choose when they're going to be born. And so I know that you, I couldn't predict it. And even though I knew that, I still thought that I was going to go early. And I did not. I was, my due date came and went. And I was five days over and I was with my first daughter. I never reached that point where I was like, wow, I don't know that I can do this anymore. But with my second pregnancy, I was really, really big and it was hard to move. It was hard to, to mother in feeling so big. And I was feeling probably just as much pressure that I was putting on myself, but it seemed as if I was feeling pressure from people around me to um, have the baby. And every day I wake up and and my husband and I would look at each other and think, you know, is today the day? Are we, you know, is it today? He's a teacher. So he would leave for school in the morning and, you know, he's really busy during the day. And so we, um, I was like, you've just got to be able to watch your phone. And so the day before I went into labor, I felt really ill. Like I just felt, I didn't feel good. I actually ended up throwing up. And for the first time towards the end of the pregnancy, uh, my mother-in-law took my daughter for the day. And so I stay home right now. I wasn't working. And my husband had urged me, you know, cause he, he knew how tired I was. He was like, send Quincy to my mom and just rest. And I hadn't done it, but this day I was like, okay, I really need to. And for the first time, it seemed like in my whole pregnancy, I just laid in bed all day. I just didn't feel well. And then the next day I woke up and I felt so much better. I felt so much more refreshed. I had a lot more energy. I took my daughter to the park. We played. It was great. I felt so much better. And then that afternoon, I took a shower. And as I was getting dressed, I lifted my leg to, uh, uh, to put my pants on. 
and I squirted on the floor and it was so great. You have to define squirt for everyone's listening. Blood, amniotic oh, fluid, yes. pee, well, pee, like all I of th- it. <laughs> yeah. I thought it was pee at first. Well, because I was like, at that point I felt so big that I was like, I don't know. I probably just pee on the floor. I don't know. And then I was like, I don't know. That doesn't really seem like pee. And so I took a picture of it, like, you know, anyone would do and sent it to my midwife. And I was like, I don't know if I peed on the floor (laughs) or if my water is breaking. I don't know. And she was like, okay, you know, that could be your water breaking. Just, you know, let me know if anything changes. Just rest and take your time. And so there was never... Um, And that was like one o'clock in the afternoon. There was never a gush or anything that followed. And over the course of the next couple hours, I would have little tiny, tiny little gushes here and there. When I would um, like change positions or if I was sitting down and I stood up, I would have tiny little gushes in my pants. I was just in touch with my midwife throughout this, but for several hours, I didn't have any other signs at all. No sensations in my stomach, no cramping, no blood, nothing. Okay. I'm going to jump in real quick with a teachable moment. So this is what's called premature rupture of the membranes or PROM. It's when your water ruptures, the first sign of labor is like your water rupturing or your water leaking. Now, data shows that most moms will begin to have contractions within six to eight hours. It can take 24 or 48 hours even. But most of the time, I don't know where you're going with the story, but most of the time within six or eight hours, you'll start to have some like cramping or some sensation. Some women will have prom, premature rupture. And then, you know, right away, they start having contractions. The reason I wanted to intervene though is the tiny gushes because, you know, we watch on TV like, you know, this, this flooding. And one of the best examples that I love to share about your water breaking or your amniotic sac is it can create a tear anywhere in the sac. So like up where the baby's foot is or down by where the baby's head is very low. And so imagine if there you were carrying a cup of coffee and at the top of like your amniotic sac, imagine is like the top of your cup of coffee and you start walking and coffee starts spilling out. Your very, very full cup of coffee starts spilling out over the top, but you still have like a whole bunch of coffee in your mug, right? That could be what we call a high tear. So there's like a high tear. Mm -hmm. And so you have these, so when you get up and you start moving around, like you're trying to hold your very full cup of coffee and it just starts spilling over, spilling out, but you still have the majority of your waters, you know, or your cup of coffee in the thing. There's also something else that happens with the tiny gushes where the head is so low, it actually reseals. So then when you move to your left or the right and it wiggles that head a little bit, some of that fluid can like, that's building up can like slip out past the head because the head is kind of sealed um, Mm. the water from leaking out. So when I hear a story like yours, Jody, and I hear about these tiny little gushes, I think, you know, either you had a high tear or your head, the head was so low, it was sealing Mm. So it was just letting a little bit of amniotic fluid out, you know, here and there as you moved around. Yeah, that sounds exactly like what was happening, Yeah, which was different because in my first labor, my water broke just moments before the baby was born. And so, um, yeah, so that was happening. And then around a couple hours later, around 3.30, my midwives, there were two, um, wanted to come and just check in. And so they came and listened to the baby and just checked in with me and just face to face and and connected, which was really nice. And she said that, and I had read this, that a lot of times with a second baby, that your body knows when um, it's okay. And that often labor will pick up after the older sibling is in bed. 1000%. Like 
I have just had three births in a row of second time moms. And they kind of had these putsy labors during the day. And I told all three of them the same thing. When you put blah, blah, baby to bed tonight, your labor is going to get kicked into high gear. And when we did their follow-up postpartums, they're like, I can't believe it. Like you are right. So let's just honor that right now. We're mammals. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, they birth their babies at night when they're, their youngest are tucked away and asleep and are safe and that they can both protect their older child and safely birth a baby because we go into our, our primal mammalian selves. So mm-hmm. what a wonderful thing for your midwives to have shared with you so that you weren't like discouraged, I mm-hmm. should say. Mm-hmm. Hey, it's Heidi. I'm interrupting the podcast to let you know about a free resource that I've created for you at birthstory.com. All you have to do is go to birthstory.com and then click the tab that says the workbook. Once you put your email address in, an entire resource library of all of my secret sauces are available to you for free as my thank you for listening to the Birth Story podcast and being part of this community. At birthstory.com, under the workbook, you will find a birth plan template, articles on circumcision, delayed cord clamping, flipping a breech baby, packing your hospital bag, acupressure points, placenta encapsulation, and so much more. There are over 20 free articles ready for you to download at birthstory.com. Now let's get back to this amazing episode. Then my husband came home from work. He came home a little bit early and um, the midwives left and they said, you know, that they would expect things to pick up a little bit later in the evening and just to be in touch. At that point, I was still not having any contractions or anything. So then we just kind of went on with our evening. I had made bean burgers for dinner that night and we realized that we didn't have any ketchup for our French fries that I'd made. And so my husband left to go to the grocery store. And while he was gone, I was finishing preparing dinner and I felt something. I felt something. And my daughter was here with me and I didn't feel like I needed to use the bathroom, but I just felt like I needed to be in the bathroom. And I remember saying to her, like, I'm, let's go to the bathroom. And she came with me and while I was in there, it reminded me of that, the feeling that I had in my first birth, that I just kind of wanted to be in like a small space. I just wanted to be in like my own little space. And then once I was in the bathroom, I felt another contraction come and I texted my husband. I was like, Hey, uh, you might want to come home. I think that I'm starting to have contractions. And so this was around 6 30 PM. So about five and a half hours after I had had that first um, leak of amniotic fluids. Yeah, date right on with data. Mm-hmm. Like I said, six to eight hours, so five mm-hmm. and a half hours. Now I have a question for you. So Quincy's with you and you're in the bathroom like, and she had gone to your prenatal appointments with you and stuff. Had you wanted her to be part of the birth process or were you hoping to like birth while she was sleeping? I had had a lot of conflictual feelings about this. I wanted to leave that open, um, but I had prepared her in the ways that I felt like I could. We, I had shown her many videos of um, live births and we had, there's a book um, that I had read with her about home birth. And I had talked to her about, and she had seen the video you know, videos of, you can find lots of videos of like peaceful birds. And so I showed her videos and we talked about the different sounds that she might hear. So I did want to prepare her in case it felt right for her to be there. And I wanted also to know that if it wasn't right for me or her that, or anyone involved, that we had other options as well. Got it. You're such a good mom, Jody. Oh, thanks. <laughs> like, I mean, really, it's so, I don't know, just hearing you 
to go into such detail about planning is so beautiful. Mm. So there you are and you're in the bathroom and you're with Quincy and you know, mm-hmm. is she, what's she doing? She's just kind of sticking around. Um, you know, we had talked about it and I was telling her, you know, I think our baby is telling me that she's ready to come out. And the difference um, in this labor is that it picked up very, very quickly. You know, with my first labor, I felt like I had, you know, it was a nine hour labor from first, from start to finish, but I feel like I had like four or five hours of warming up. And the second one, it's as if I was at the sink washing dishes and getting dinner ready. And then I was in active labor. Like after that first and second contraction, I was in active labor. And by the time my husband got home from the grocery store, I was half naked in the bathroom, like telling, he was like, how are you doing? And I was like, I'm having a baby. <laughs> I can't really talk to you right now. Um, <laughs> it, 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 it happened really quick. It was yeah. very quick. So your husband's home and you're like, honey, I'm having a baby like right now. Mm-hmm. And um, when did you call the midwaves again? <laughs> So at that point, I had started, before he got home from the grocery store, I had already started timing the contractions with a timer app Mm -hmm. on my phone. And they were, by the time he got home from the grocery store, and I mean, the grocery store is like 10 minutes away, less. He, they were longer than a minute long and two to three minutes apart. And my, he had texted the midwife, Hey, I think that, um, you know, Jody's having some contractions and told her that uh, things were moving along. And she said to just be in touch and that she imagined things, as we mentioned, would pick up after my daughter was in bed. And then she asked how long, how far apart were the contractions? And he told her and she said, okay, I'm on my way now. (laughs) So, you know, as we talked about, I had debated, I had Part of me really wanted my daughter to be there for it, but when the time came, I needed to be oh, I needed to be alone. And um, so my husband was amazing. He he was checking on me, and he had taken Quincy out into our living room area to get her dinner. Um, his mother came over to play with her, and they played for a little while. And then I just felt like I needed space. I just needed, it was, and I had read that women experience this, that, you know, there are women that experience this, that I felt like I needed to be able to focus and not have a part of my mind, um, wanting to care for her and know that she was okay. And, and so my mother-in-law, they packed a bag and she went to spend the night with my mother-in-law which I'm glad that we had left that open because I think that was the right decision for us. And it just kind of played itself out. I don't think that I could have committed to that ahead of time, but I was glad that we had arranged those options for us. Then the midwife came. And so she arrived around 7 p.m. And um, when she arrived, my daughter was still here. And it was really special because they started getting the the birthing pool ready right away. And she was able to be a part of that. And, oh, she's, she was just so precious. She would, I was in the, the bathroom of our bedroom and she would come in every few minutes, every little while and just check on me and just say, mommy, you're doing great. And it was just so special. And she helped the midwife blow up the pool and she felt like she, she was a part of it. And then she was able to leave and be with her Nana. And so that worked out. And so, um, as they're getting the pool ready, I was listening to my hypno babies affirmations and, and, uh, tracks in my headphones and just staying in the zone. And, uh, my first labor, I had a little rug that I stood on and I felt the same here. I, I'm not sure what the connection there is for me, but I was standing on our little bath mat and that was just my little safe place the, where I stayed and I swayed and just moved my body back and forth, back and forth as all of the commotion happened around me as they were preparing and laying out the tools on the bed and then as soon as the water was ready, 
I got in the pool and it was just heaven, just, just such relief to be in the water and things progressed, just kept going, just kept going. I listened to hypno babies the whole time. And similar to my first birth, I just started pushing. It just happened. And right before this, uh, right before I started pushing, my legs uh, were shaking. And I remember being kind of surprised, a little startled by that. And the midwife later told me that that was part of the the transition and that she could tell that I was getting ready to push. And so when she saw my, my leg shaking like that. We tend to call it the labor shakes. Not everyone experiences it and definitely not on every birth, but I would say most women experience the labor shakes at some point. And it, it is indicating that you're getting very close to the end. Mm-hmm. And um, so I started pushing and I mean, it's just, I can, thinking about it now, I can recall that feeling. It's just it's like nothing you've ever experienced before until you have. And the, that feeling, it once I started pushing, it felt productive and it felt like something was happening. I could feel her move down. When she was crowning, she, her head came out until about her ears and then she kind of stalled and I pushed and pushed and pushed and she was kind of, I don't know that she was stuck or why really um, it kind of stalled there, but the midwives helped me change position. So I went from laying on my back to up on my knees with one leg up. And then once I was able to change position, positions, that really helped her continue to come. and. Then once her head was out, uh, I kind of paused and rested for a few breaths and then kept pushing and kept pushing and kept pushing. And then finally she came out and she didn't cry right away. And the midwife gave her, we, we waited just a minute. And then the midwife gave her a little breath. We waited and then it was and when we talked about it afterward, the midwife said that it was still within the range of what is okay and normal. And they were checking her heart rate the whole time. She was still getting blood and oxygen from the placenta. Um, but it wasn't like, you know, some of the things that you see where the baby comes out and just cries right away. It took a minute for her to cry. And the midwife gave her a few little puffs of air and then she um, she cried and the other midwife, one of the other midwives that was there asked us her name. And we said, her name is Joy. And she said, call your baby to you. And we said, Joy, Joy. And it was just, and then she cried. And it was just a really beautiful moment of just seeing this baby come to life in my arms right there. And it was wonderful. It was beautiful. She wow. was nice. Nine pounds, 14 ounces. What? She was a big baby and she was born at 9.06 p.m. So the labor was like two and a half hours long. Wow. Well, I'm glad you had planned for a home birth because <laughs> you're probably having a home birth either way. <laughs> then, yes, yes. Oh, what a wonderful, beautiful story. I mean, and I love her name. Like, I mean, how joyous to have Mm -hmm. a joy, you know, come in. And so you had said earlier, like I was so big, like you knew you were Mm -hmm. probably having like this Mm -hmm. big, big, healthy baby. And you said at 40 weeks and five days. Mm -hmm. That's Um, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so there you are just basking in this beautiful moment. And for anyone listening, we're going to take a pause and just end Jody's birth story right there. If you've loved it, then you can just stop here or you can keep listening. We just want to let you know there's a trigger warning. Jody is about to share with us what happened after that moment. It could be a little hard to hear and it's very rare. And so as a podcast that's supporting you to prepare for the birth that you want, no matter what it looks like. 
this probably isn't going to happen to you. But just in case, we want to give you some practical tools too. So I'm going to let Jody go on and continue the rest of um, your story. Thank you. So I was still in the pool and Joy was doing great. And we were waiting, keeping an eye out for the placenta to come. And I was not having any uh, contractions afterwards to, to help the placenta come. I wasn't feeling anything. Then the midwives did, as after we waited for a little while, they did give me a shot of Pitocin to help the placenta come. And as we were, we continued to wait, they wanted um, me to move to the bed. So I passed Joy to my husband and I moved to the bed to help them get a better look and, and to wait for the placenta. And it what we later learned was that the placenta, uh, it was a condition called placenta accreta, where the placenta had adhered to the uterine wall and was having a difficult time releasing. And so the midwife did try to manually uh, remove the placenta. And then after um, a little while, there was some hemorrhaging and we decided to transfer to the hospital where um, they helped with a DNC to remove the placenta and and help uh, manage the hemorrhaging. And I just want to just take a minute right there and define placenta accreta. It's a serious pregnancy condition and it occurs, like you said, when the placenta actually grows. So as the placenta is growing, it grows too deeply into the uterine wall. So it's not actually something that happens like at childbirth or because of childbirth. It's something that's been, it's a condition that's been developing, but that we don't know about until you're trying to deliver your placenta. And it's so deeply grown into the uterine wall that it doesn't detach from the uterine wall. And so um, this is the condition that Jody is talking about. Placenta accreta occurs only in point. 2% of all pregnancies. But if someone has experienced placenta accreta with a previous pregnancy, they are at a higher risk for developing the condition in a subsequent pregnancy in a cesarean section is often recommended. So I just want to leave that if this story is unsettling you, it's 0.2% of all pregnancies only. And, you know, the, um, the doctors that I worked with at the hospital assured me that it would have happened uh, had I had a home birth or a hospital birth. You know, as you're mentioning, it wasn't related to the home birth at all. And the midwives were very professional and competent. The, the midwives were very competent in their work. And there came a moment, you know, and to be honest, I, at first, I didn't really want to transfer to the hospital. There did come a time where they said, you know what, we, it's better if we do that. And I really appreciate their professionalism in that moment that really saved my life and, and protected me and my family and our baby. And uh, one of the midwives stayed at home with the baby until my husband was able to get back home. And so she was able to stay safely at home. No, wow. So Joy was able to not transfer with you. She um, did not transfer, right? And so she was never admitted into the hospital. And amazingly, um, this one of the midwives contacted someone that she knew who was able to bring donor milk to Joy at midnight on the night that she was born. And um, the mother, and I didn't realize this until like a couple of days after that, but this angel mom who showed up at our home when I was not here, she nursed Joy for the first time and then gave us her milk um, to, to that my husband spoon fed her until I was able to be reunited with her um, like 24 hours later. So how long were you in the hospital for? It was three days and two nights. And then I had one more question. How long were you at home after delivery until you were in the hospital? 
about an, an hour after Joy was born when we um, decided to go ahead and transfer. Okay. And it was about one hour. Mm-hmm. Okay. The reason that I asked that is that typically with an all natural childbirth, the placenta releases anywhere from right away to 30 minutes. Sometimes it can take much longer than that. But typically when it goes around that hour or more, we start thinking that there might have been some growth into the into the uterine wall. So 24 hours later, you're reunited with Joy. I want to know a little bit more about, like I had just asked you how long till you transferred. How did the transfer go? My midwife came with me. She transferred with me. My husband and the midwife came with me and she stayed with me the whole time. There were two midwives. So one of them stayed home in my home with the baby while the other midwife and my husband came to the hospital with me. And then once we were clear on the care that I would receive at the hospital, my husband left and came back to our home to be with the baby. And, you know, the whole time that I, through, through the process of the transfer and while being at the hospital, she stayed with me the whole time. And I felt so cared for, so supported. And I just could not, um, I could never find it in my heart to think. I could never find the words in my heart to thank her for being by me during those moments. And um, she stayed with me until I think it was like four o'clock the next morning in the morning when my parents arrived at the hospital to be with me. So she stayed with me all through the night. And then when my parents arrived, she left and then she came back the next day um, and then the next day and then the next day. And so um, once I was back at um, my house, she, she came and checked on us here too. And so she was just incredibly supportive and loving and nurturing. And I felt very protected and um, I felt like she was a strong voice for me at the hospital. And I just, I owe her everything for those moments. I love it. What an honor for your beautiful midwife. Hopefully we can share this episode with her and just know how much she's loved and appreciated and wanted in this community and offering home birth for women. So I love it. Thank you for sharing both of your stories, home birth in Colombia, South America in the previous episode, and then home birth in the United States. So Jody, I know that you mentioned the milk catchers were your favorite baby product on the last episode. (laughs) But now I'm going to pressure you again for a second favorite baby product for mom. Okay. So for me, with both of my pregnancies, I had wonderful nightgowns to wear that had buttons up the front. And so I was able to nurse in bed. And, you know, I'm not someone who really ever wore nightgowns before I had babies. But something about having a cozy nightgown that made me feel comfortable and also allowed me to nurse the baby easily. It was just a special feeling of like nesting in in those first days. So a nightgown that buttons in the front. Okay. Well, that sounds like so cozy and so sensory too. And I'm going to make you find the link so that we can link to the specific nightgowns that you recommend. Um, along with the milk catchers and the show notes for both episodes. Again, if you love Jody, please listen to both episodes, like the previous one where we talked about home birth in Colombia, South America. And then thank you for tuning in to this one also about this beautiful home birth. And then Jody, are you on social media? Like where can people connect with you if they want to talk to you about home birth or birthing in another country? Yes, I love talking about home, home birth and natural birth. And my Instagram is Jody Piscatelli 8. You need to spell that, please. <laughs> okay. J O D I P I S C I T E L L I, the number eight. All right. Jody Piscatelli 8. I hope that some people reach out to you. Thank you for being one of the educators today on the show to teach us all about like autonomous birthing 
and beautiful home birth. And I've just really enjoyed getting to know you. So thank you thank so you much. Thank you so much for this platform and opportunity to tell these stories that are so special to me. Thank you for listening to Birth Story. My goal is you will walk away from each episode with a clear picture of how labor and delivery might go, and that you will feel empowered by the end of your pregnancy to speak up, plan and prepare for the birth you want. 